when I was in Germany, so we studied a lot of, um, uh, we had a lot of projects concerning the viruses and how these viruses infect the cells. Usually we were uh, working, I was working on the uh, for retroviruses. The retroviruses are the viruses that have uh, mm, uh, the particular mechanism of replication of their genetic material, not as a conventional uh, method you have in, in the viruses. Usually you have the, if you have the DNA viruses, then you have the DNA, uh, DNA which will convert, which you will convert uh, to the RNA via replic transcription. And after uh, that process, you have the, the translation, you have to translate the, uh, the RNA, the, the RNA into the polypeptide chain to form the protein. So in this particular uh, virus, we have the reverse transcriptase enzyme, and this enzyme is, is a kind of unique to convert the RNA RNA genetic material into the DNA, and then you will have the expression of the uh, particular genes in the DNA. You can transcribe the, the DNA and translate the RNA uh, to produce the protein. So, as you can see here, you have the HIV uh, life cycle. And uh, this, uh, the, the first, the, the most important stage of this cycle is, of course, to go into the cell and to, uh, to use genetic material of the cell for the integration. And after that, you will have a nuclear expert for the assembly and body of the viral particles. So uh, the viruses would uh, transcribe their genetic material. First, they will convert it to the DNA to integrate into the uh, in the host to the host genome. And after some 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 time, they would uh, they would start to express their genes to produce the viruses. And this is the this mechanism is poorly understood. There are some some factors which are not really uh, very well understood and investigated so far, such as the, uh, the nuclear input of the genetic of the viral, virus genetic material, viral genetic material to the nucleus for the integration. So uh, that time we were trying to analyze what kind of proteins are associated with this process and uh, why it is, uh, uh, why these proteins are, uh, uh, what is the function of their proteins and how they exactly interact with the uh, viral cDNA in order to uh, go through the nuclear pore. I was also uh, using a lot of experimental uh, data and experimental techniques and the cloning, I did some mutations, I uh, substituted some, uh, some fragments to form some very peculiar uh, structures like DNA flap in, uh, in order to reconstitute some uh, intra, uh, intranuclear trafficking of this material uh, using some other viruses which are not really uh, very harmful for the uh, for humans like uh, foamy viruses they are also uh, the retroviruses but they don't really have the uh, this particular uh, this particular structure like dna flap which is very important to create this kind of pre-integration complex to persuade the DNA to into the 
nuclear through the nuclear ore complex into the nucleus for for the uh, sub subsequent integration into the host genome. So this process is very complex. You also have uh, microtubules, tubules, uh, tubular complex associated with the uh, pre-integrated complex, <coughs> as you as you can see here. <coughs> As you can see, uh, you also have a very mm, sophisticated uh, structure, nuclear uh, river, nuclear structure, uh, like uh, like was uh, like was depicted like depicted here in this picture. You have different proteins forming this structure, and also the DNA, uh, the viral DNA. You have. Uh, integrase, you have reverse transcriptase, you have some auxiliary protein like VPR protein, MA protein. So, uh, and uh, after, no, on the top of that, you also have the, some proteins which are uh, very important for the integration. They are known as a host protein, auxiliary host proteins, or they're called transportins. Transportins are the Host proteins, uh, uh, they enter to the nuclear core complex and well, on one hand, on the other, <coughs> the other, they also enter to the integrase and uh, kind of uh, intermediate the process of uh, translocation of this uh, viral material, translocation from the cytoplasm, cytoplasm to the nuclear plasm. So, very complicated process, many proteins, and at that time we were trying to investigate, <coughs> we were trying to reconstitute this mechanism in the formula viruses. On the other hand, I was trying to do a computational uh, model and to understand how uh, this, uh, this event happens if you, for instance, try to analyze transportin proteins and the integrase proteins of the, of the virus. And uh, before this process, before the, this process starts, you should have the interaction with uh, some, uh, some receptors, a CD4 receptor. This is the helper, uh, helper cell, the <clears throat> T helper cell and uh, you have the uh, the receptors. Last time I also mentioned a little CCR5, uh, GP120, and this interaction is very important to uh, initiate the fusion of the uh, viral particle to the cell membrane. You also have a different co-receptors as, as shown here. So last time I give you some uh, some introduction on some substances how we can actually uh, we can we can try to uh, interfere with this process in order to uh, to to block the the fusion of the virus with the uh, with the t helper cell and uh, the structure of the transportin is shown here it's also Quite uh, uh, quite complicated. You have a lot of uh, uh, you have some loops which are kind of flexible, and you also have it's like S S like structure. You have different sides. You also have H8 loops, and this loops is in kind of mediates the interaction with run GTP uh, GTP uh, protein. Uh, to uh, to in order to trans to mediate this kind of uh, its trafficking through the nuclear core complex. So actually, this this protein mediates the the trafficking of different uh, protein, not just uh, uh, HIV protease, but also some uh, some uh, some very important uh, proteins like RAN GTP. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, this receptor, is, this kind of protein, is plays a also important role in the, in the cellular 
cellular metabolism. And you have this flap, which also uh, interacts with some sites, some sites uh, within the molecule, like site B, uh, as, a, as a free form. And uh, you have site, site A and site B, and when it interacts with site uh, side B, then you would uh, initiate uh, the release of some some substrates like uh, like NLS the molecule, like the signal. This is like nuclear nucleic signal uh, signal protein in a transport in a transport substrate. So the process is very complicated. You have an LS protein on one hand which interacts with site A, and you have at the same time like run GTP uh, within the uh, nuclear envelope when it interacts with the site A. So you would uh, produce this, this loop to interact with the site B, and uh, NLS would, would, will, release, will be released from this molecule. And uh, uh, at this point, you have also uh, this particular structure of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of site A. You get like zinc finger uh, domain, then you have a catalytic core domain and the DNA binding domain. So, and therefore we wanted, uh, this, is the, this is the structure of H loop. So the H loop is a kind of a, some kind of a MIDI, uh, some kind of a control mechanism which controls the uh, the binding and the release of different protein molecules uh, within the transportin structure. So it's a very complicated mechanism. You have a free form, then you have some kind of preloaded form, and you have loaded form when both uh, uh, both sides are occupied and when you have the additional within the nucleus when you have additional interaction around GDP then this H8 loop uh, would interact with the side B and then you have a release this molecule so as, as you can see we have also a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh, alpha helices here, so the mostly uh, the most uh, prevalent stru secondary structure here is the alpha helix, and these alpha helices would uh, uh, would create some kind of a s s s like structure uh, help with the help of uh, uh, the turns which connect connect this. Uh, Alpha, numerous alpha helices. And therefore, at the time I was uh, trying to uh, analyze the, um, the interaction between the transportin, uh, transportin uh, protein and the HIV integrase, so as, as shown here. So we know that there is some interaction between transportin and the integrase. So I, I wanted to model this particular interaction using some uh, synthetic biology uh, information and some molecular modeling tools. So then I tried to uh, create some kind of, a, some kind of a interaction due to this, uh, as, as shown on the scheme, to produce some kind of a complex. So I, I used the molecular docking uh, of the HIV integrase and on one hand on the other I use the uh, transporting SR, SR mm, protein and as you can see there is uh, there is some interaction this is the protein protein interaction uh, I also analyzed different energies uh, and different uh, and different parameters of uh, of this interaction, so I got some uh, some high confidence uh, complexes that might occur during this interaction, and 
I try to also to understand the differences between different uh, variants of the transportin family. You have also transportin SR1 and transportin SR2. And I try to superimpose to see how it's actually, how it's actually, uh, uh, what are the differences between the, the 3, 3D structure and what is, what is the root mean square deviation between these two uh, molecules. Uh, this uh, study was published in, uh, in 2010, so those of you who is interested could find the, the paper on the internet. So then I tried to explore the flexible docking of transportin uh, SR and H8 loop as, uh, as was shown previously here, we have this H, yes, H, H loop, which dominates and kind of governs the translocation mechanism. So I had this, uh, this loop and uh, I found that there is some kind of a binding uh, site probably, which uh, most likely is the area where this interaction is taking place. So I did the, the molecular docking experiment and I had found that some residues uh, is a lysine aspartic residues lysine uh, interacting for uh, for will between uh, within H8 loop and the uh, uh, transportin uh, and the HIV HIV structure. So sorry, I have. Uh, okay, so uh, so this was the uh, this was the interaction. So I tried to uh, reconstitute this uh, this interaction, and uh, I had I, I have found that there are some uh, some some residues. They are both taking place at uh, at. Uh, if you're trying to try and to model the situation with the H loop and NLS, NLS, uh, NLS structure, so you got this arginine uh, 336 in glycine and uh, asparagine, aspartic acid 328 is a lysine 161, and they are kind of important. You can see that uh, this, when you analyze the, the, the binding site, you, you could find some, uh, some, some, some residues and they are uh, forming the hydrogen bonds within uh, the protein, protein yeah. interaction uh, complex formation. Then I tried to analyze the the, the indices, there are some indices like hydrophobicity index and how this hydrophobicity index correlates or correlates with residue accessibility for this particular uh, 
this particular amino acid. So I have found that uh, these structures also are very, uh, very uh, some struct. This uh, this particular amino acids are hydro hydrophobic on one hand and uh, uh, less hydrophobicity. Uh, less hydrophobicity also uh, will uh, pro produce some uh, smaller percentage of uh, residual accessibility. Usually, uh, it's vice versa because you have uh, you have uh, like you have here uh, the, the high amount of uh, 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 the. The high, uh, the high amount of hydrophobicity and also the, the higher percentage of uh, this is the device versa if you will take the soluble proteins when the residues are exposed to the uh, aqueous environment so if the residue is very uh, hydrophilic then the, the, they might uh, more exposed to the uh, aqueous environment. On the other hand, if the residue is uh, less hydrophilic, more hydrophobic, then probably the residues are less exposed because they're kind of hidden inside to form in, to fo form in the hydrophobic core of the protein, and therefore uh, they are kind of uh, create they are they're hidden and they're creating. Uh, the, the creating the hydrogen, usually they create in the protein ligand binding sites within the protein. So this is the idea uh, to analyze uh, these residues, why we have this pro particular residues but not the other residues. And uh, as you can see here, we have, uh, we have some uh, very, very uh, hydro, uh, philic residues and these hydrophilic residues are highly exposed and the hydrophobic residues are uh, hidden inside and less exposed. So this was the, the summary of, I would like to give you in terms of, the, of this analysis. And uh, after, after some, uh, uh, the, the last thing I wanted to mention, I want to mention, I. I try to reconstruct the, the whole uh, complex where you have transportin and uh, integrase, integrase complex uh, as shown here. So as you can see, this is a very uh, sophisticated picture, very, com very uh, uh, complex. This complex is, uh, is uh, is formed uh, by using uh, two uh, molecules of uh, transportin and also uh, two molecules of uh, uh, HIV integrase. And uh, it's not complete because uh, there are some other proteins uh, which are interacted, like VPR and uh, also the, the viral, uh, viral DNA. Viral DNA, cDNA, which is not present here. So, okay. And uh, the other project I was also talking about, just to want want to mention how molecular docking could be used in the analysis of uh, uh, some cyclodextrins with uh, some uh, anesthetics. And here is a nicely, it's nicely shown. On this picture, when you have the in silica screening of uh, cyclodextrin formulated uh, general anesthetic. So we have the in vivo blood band barrier study using mice on one hand, on the other, we have the molecular modeling. And we are using here the, the two uh, excipients one is the sulfur butyl ether, cyclodextrin, and the other is hydroxypropyl uh, cyclodextrin. And as a, as a ligand, we are using uh, propofol uh, and propofolate 
sodium propofolate, which is a kind of ion here, dissociates into a propofolate and a, a negatively charged propofolate and a positively charged sodium ion. And we tried also to analyze the activity, uh, and analyze the binding activity to the particular cyclodextrin. So we have the experimental data. From this experimental data, you can, can see that we have uh, propofol against the propofolate and HPBCD. And we were trying to use the propofolate and propofol as a control. So we tried to understand how it's really going through the mm, blood brain barrier. So we measured the concentration in the blood and then we can we measured the concentration in the, in the brain, although the deviation is high due to the, uh, the, uh, due to the uh, methodology we used, because we used the uh, homogenates, uh, homogenates produced by, or produced from the brain, we harvest the brain. I did this experiment, I harvest the brain, then I prepared the homogenate, and I I use this homogenates to, uh, to analyze, the, uh, analyze the drug concentration using the HPLC. So, but actually, we, uh, we, we were successful to, in this analysis, although the deviation in, in three experiments would give us some, some high degree of the uh, degree of standard deviation because the, the drug is also lipophilic, it would stick highly to the brain tissue. Uh, due to this reason, we have kind of uh, uh, very high deviation in a, in, a, in, a, in a triplet, in the triplet settings. So as you can see, when we have the formulation of uh, with uh, uh, with uh, hydrophilic, uh, mildly hydrophilic cyclodextrin, we would increase the, uh, the, permeate, the propofolate substance permeation through the blood brain barrier. And here uh, also the, mm, the, the binding of propofolate to the cyclodextrin, and this binding is. Uh, is uh, it's not that strong in comparison to the uh, propofol HPBCD, which will highly, uh, which with a, which has the higher affinity to the SBCD substance. On the other hand, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the this excipients, the HPBCD as, a, as an excipient, will increase the solubility of the uh, propofolate substance and would also increase the blood brain barrier permeation. So, there, there are also some other experiments I, I've done in the past using the screening of carbon nanoparticles and, as a drug delivery vectors. And we had the, the so, uh, some, some substances like fullerens and also nanotube. For the nanotube, I did uh, the experiment uh, using the, using the uh, transwell system and how this, uh, uh, and this substance would permeate through the blood brain barrier. We also uh, did some uh, cytotoxicity tests using the uh, the, uh, the MTT uh, MTT test here, and uh, uh, you could calculate the the toxic dosage 50 from this experiment. Uh, of course, you need the control, and then you would also use the the, the, the organic solvents like DMS, 10% DMSO, to uh, use it as a, uh, as a positive control. And after that, you could uh, try to use, to, you, get a, 
negative control, you get a positive control, and you have your substances. And you just uh, incubate the, the multiple carbon nanotube link, uh, either linked to the reporter molecule to uh, visualize. Here we, we used FITS. Uh, Fluoristine is a tiocyanide uh, linked to the multiple carbon nanotube to uh, uh, evaluate the, the toxicity by using the luminescence to the control. And uh, but for this experiments, we're just analyzing the, uh, the, the, the conversion, the formazan conversion and the uh, fit in the MTT test, but uh, uh, for, for the multiple nanotubes, we could also use some, uh, some uh, uh, fluorescence uh, by implementing the, uh, the confocal microscopy. And we also did the confocal or fluorescent microscopy where we can actually calculate the uh, uh, the localization of this substance within the within the cells and how they are, uh, the, the how the concentration would reduce with time. Uh, these experiments could be also feasible to uh, to apply when you have the molecule with uh, with some substance with a reporter molecule like fits. And uh, from these experiments, you can see that. Uh, we don't really have a very uh, high uh, cytotoxic, cytotoxicity uh, produced by multivolt carbon nanotube. Usually, uh, the, the carbon, the toxicity, uh, uh, the, the, higher toxi the highest toxicity associated with some uh, 2D uh, carbon allotropes like. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, like graphans and graphans, when you get some some surfaces, some with the with the uh, cutting edges, and uh, these edges uh, could cut the cells into the pieces, and this would create uh, the when you, this would uh, produce the higher highest higher toxicity. Uh, value uh, levels for this particular substance. So uh, for this material, we, we didn't really observe the high, tox high, high toxicity due to the absence of this mechanism. Then again, you can compare these values with the 10% DMSO, which is quite toxic for the cells. And in the control, we don't really have any, any toxicity at all. On the other hand, you could uh, try to use the, uh, uh, substances like fullerens, and these fullerens were screened uh, to uh, be a substrate to, for the uh, PGP transporter. And this PGP transporter is known, is well known as a multi drug resistance contributor. And this is the 3D structure. This is the electron microscopy simulated uh, 3D structure. Uh, scanning electron microscopy simulated a 3D structure at the molecular level, uh, submerged into the membrane. Uh, here is the exterior of, the, of this transport. And uh, this is the interior. You get nucleotide binding domain one and nucleotide binding domain two. For the for the energy NTP NTP conversion, which is what is taking place at this particular domain and the lipid membrane. So in this particular site, uh, this is the, some some kind of a uh, substrate binding site where the interact the protein ligand interaction is taking place. So uh, we were trying we were trying to analyzed different uh, uh, different uh, fullerenes and, uh, uh, and what are the differences in 
in this interaction and how they actually, uh, how this interaction correlates with the size of these uh, materials. And you can see that if you increase the size, obviously you, you will increase the, the number of uh, interacting residues. And most of these residues, they are tyrosine, very lipophilic residues, which is of course not a, not a surprise here. You have some kind of a pipeline stocking mechanism involved in the P PGP interaction with carbon nanotubes. So you can analyze the pi stocking, which is taking place. And you could also analyze different distances uh, as a descriptors of this interaction. And uh, uh, the, the tilting of this particular, uh, uh, particular residues, the, the, the tilting of the uh, aromatic rings, uh, the tilting aromatic rings could also uh, be uh, analyzed in, for these interactions. And uh, here's the, the, a little bit of uh, information on the uh, synthetic biology we have right now. We have the project uh, related to the, the folding. Probably I will just uh, take a break and proceed uh, in 15, 10, 15 minutes. Types of cancer. So this is uh, this is more sophisticated test than just a histogram. Here we have so we have the uh, the here we just in incubated the uh, the the same concentration of the substance, and here is kind of a a uh, dynamic curve you could produce when you use the different concentration for um, uh, for your for your substance, and uh, uh, you would produce some kind of S-like curve uh, with a different uh, inhibition effect. So from this curve, you can determine the IC50, which is uh, called the inhibition concentration 50. Uh, the 50 percent uh, at, at this concentration you have the uh, 50 percent of inhibition uh, for this particular cancer we were as i uh, as i remember correctly here we were using the capture two cells for well known for for the uh, liver uh, cancer and uh, also the the correlation, um, correlation coefficient, the Mapierson coefficient is 0 0.7, which is also quite uh, acceptable uh, for this type of analysis. So from, for this kind of curve, you can determine the IC50, or sometimes it's called also effective concentration 50, if you have the effect here. So this would, uh, this graph, uh, would be called as a agonist uh, uh, inhibition effect. Agonist. So you have agonist simulation effect and the agonist inhibition effect. So here is the uh, inhibition effect, but uh, you have the increase of the, the inhibition. So it's a kind of something in between. And uh, if you would uh, test. Uh, different substances, then you have to produce a lot of curves like that for, for each of these uh, substance. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to parameterize the substance starting from a very small concentration to reach the very high concentration. Usually you have to add some, uh, some logarithmic curve here because you would probably uh, go from uh, microseconds, from nanoseconds to, to microseconds to uh, milliseconds range, and uh, it's also very, very laborious. So here we just took one concentration and did the experiment using uh, various models. And uh, we also have here the DMSO, the control, and the 
and the positive control and the negative control, but this kind of curve, the dynamic curve, is considered more sophisticated and more precise. Okay, so what about the synthetic biology collaboration? We have the collaboration in the synthetic biology at the University of Würzburg in department in the Department of Bioinformatics. The chair of the department is Professor Dandeka, and uh, the lab head is uh, Dr. Benkurova. And uh, here, this is the lab where they're doing different uh, uh, protein modifications, uh, like side directed mutagenesis. They, they are also able to express express the the genes and to generate some mutants. If you have uh, uh, this kind of plasmid, this plasmid was actually provided by Professor Benkurova. Uh, uh, the, the, the map of this plasmid and here's the cherry GDP, um, cherry GDP plasmid, GFP plasmid, so which, which, which means that you have the the two reporter molecule, one is the cherry and the other is GFP, so you can actually express different, uh, different reporter molecules. Uh, you have to modify plasmid and uh, you get some... Uh, this is, the, this is the, the direction of the replication. Uh, you have uh, some information on the... Mm, on the uh, structural elements, you have uh, the origin of the replication and uh, some, uh, some, some open reading of RAM and BLA gen, uh, BLA signal, to, where the BLA, BLA signal peptide would also interact with. And uh, you, can, uh, you can express uh, this G, usually, sometimes you also have some promoter information, like uh, in my case, it was a PUC-19 plasmid from bacteria, from the Escherichia E. coli, uh, e. coli. and uh, we had uh, uh, immediate early promoter from the cytomegalovirus uh, also uh, inserted into the this, this plasmid to express the, the gene. You also have uh, sometimes the, the selection marker, like, like gentamicin, uh, when you expressing this plasmid in a, in a bacteria, then you could, uh, you have, you, you, you make sure that only, then you will add the gentamicin to the media and the only bacteria which bear this plasmid, they will survive some kind of selection marker. Then you would, of course, uh, have uh, in, in our experiments, we also uh, did modify uh, our the genes, but here we tried to modify the GFP, uh, GFP molecule, the green fluorescent protein in order to uh, to increase or try to understand uh, what will happen with the fluorescence if we would modify the, the, uh, the residues which are important to create some, uh, some bonds between, uh, within the, the protein structure. So uh, uh, we try to analyze the uh, sulf uh, the, the sulfate bridges, which are known to to uh, to participate in a in a protein fold folding, but the the um, the exact mechanism mechanism is still unknown. So we try to uh, produce the different mutants. Uh, on the basis of the uh, uh, exchange for this uh, particular amino acids, which would contribute to these bridges, creating the uh, single uh, mutants or double mutants. And after that, we try to analyze the fluorescence 
and uh, by by this analysis we will try to investigate whether we have the uh, we, we would improve the stability or maybe we will impair the folding and how this actually intermingles with the uh, folding mechanism of this particular protein. So this is the side directed mutagenesis scheme we have and if you have the initial plasmid so you will denature this plasmid and uh, trying to create you can try to create some mutagenic primers to uh, to do the uh, PCR then you would create the, the whole plasmid by uh, by annealing process with with some uh, sites which are uh, which are uh, mutated and then you have the extension then you would uh, uh, create the uh, the reverse uh, rever by the reverse and uh, sense and anti sense primers you would create the uh, the double stranded uh, double stranded plasmid then you will uh, change the temperature to the annealing temperature and you would produce the product that's shown here so this is a kind of a kind of a very very simplified protocol to do the uh, experimental site directed mutagenesis of course this process can be also done in uh, silica you can run the, the simulation with uh, mutated primers uh, and here we did uh, similar things for the GDP trying to mutate different residues to uh, interfere with the uh, salt bridges with the salt bridges and uh, uh, first we screened uh, the, the whole protein for, for the formation of the salt bridges and after that we tried to mutate this part of the the, the gene which is responsible for this particular amino acid. So in total we created around 30 different uh, uh, different mutants. Some of them were not uh, producing any, any fluorescent but some of them uh, had uh, some uh, fluorescent signal and uh, by, by this information we could also you know, use the molecular modeling to uh, to understand what kind of amino acids which would contribute the most to the fold information and uh, what is the part of the molecule which is probably affected uh, uh, more than the others in terms of the in terms of this mutation and uh, this would also give us some probably some leverage if you would like to uh, design the, the proteins in the future and the information on the salt bridges would also give us additional information on how we could uh, either stabilize or destabilize the whole structure whole protein structure okay so and uh, the the other projects we have are trying to uh, come up with some uh, strategies using uh, uh, synthetic biology and chemoinformatics uh, techniques. Here we are mm, trying to create some kind of a pipeline based on the screening of DNA aptamers to the uh, substance which is called nivalenol. And the nivalenol is the mycotoxin, and in nature it is uh, mainly found in a in a fungi of the fusarium species. Uh, it belongs. Uh, this species belong belongs to the most prevalent mycotoxin producing fungi in the temperature regions of the northern hemisphere, and. Uh, it affects the food crop production in industry in 
in these areas where this fun, fungus is, uh, is uh, was found. So these fungi are abundant in the various agricultural products and their future uh, processed products like malt, beef and, and bread, and the fusarium species invade and grow on crops and may produce the valinol under the moist and cool conditions. So as you can see, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a very aggressive molecule and would also decrease the, the productivity of the of of different uh, of different uh, products uh, products food products uh, and uh, the idea was to create some molecule to effectively uh, bind to this molecule and uh, by by you by using that you could actually uh, you can actually decrease the the toxicity, the potential toxicity of this mycotoxin. So, what was the uh, what was the starting point for this project? We uh, we used ten rounds of selection uh, from the randomized library, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, selection was done on the basis of uh, Celex platform. Celex platform to try where we were trying to screen the the uh, optimal like optimal like structure against the this uh, particular this particular agent. So first of all, we had some primary SS DNA RNA library. In our case, this is the uh, says uh, DNA library, the single-stranded DNA library, uh, and we uh, then uh, uh, did some uh, some incubation of uh, of this uh, library with with the target molecule. Uh, then we did the separation, uh, where we only uh, only. Trying to remove all the unbound oligonucleotides and uh, come up only with some nucleotides which are bound to the, um, this particular substance. Then we did the PCR amplification, the uh, pool conditioning, and to enrich the library. And we got uh, the last round where we did the sequencing, sequencing of the uh, aptomers and aptomer candidate identification and aptomer characterization. So after this round, this uh, this uh, Celex uh, uh, experiment, we we came up with a, a huge number of uh, aptomers, about uh, three thousand four hundred unique sequences, which were found to be the bind, uh, binders to this molecule and uh, we wanted to screen this aptomers in silica to come up with a smaller number probably uh, up to 10 or up to 20 or less substances where we could uh, further use in uh, in optimization assay. So the roadmap was preliminary screening of the libraries based on the two structure analysis identification of several candidate sequences for the through photo modeling generation of the DNA structure and then silica binding site site and the verification in vitro. The verification in vitro can be done using the uh, QCM analysis or nanodrop nanodrop you nanodrop analysis we have uh, at our uh, disposal, and we have this nanodrop UV spectra 
photometer, we could actually analyze the, uh, the interaction between the ligand and the, and the, and the aptamer uh, in a way that we already did for, uh, for different substances like antibiotics, like tetracycline and hydroxyapatite on the hydroxyapatite surfaces. So we were actually successful in this analysis and we want to, to implement the similar protocols for this, for this project in the future to verify uh, the best aptamers. But first we wanted to uh, create some kind of a pipeline to screen only the best aptamers. So the, the question is, what would be the, the aptamer structure that would enhance the, the binding to this uh, nivalenol molecule and probably would uh, produce the, the best affinity to this particular substance? So what, was, what is the uh, apta, apta fault paradigm? As you can see here, we wanted to uh, to, uh, to take the aptamer sequence then pro produce some kind of a secondary structure prediction. Then uh, by using some algorithms like RNA composer, would, would, this would help us cre to create the, the RNA analog construction. And, but the problem is that the, the RNA composer algorithm doesn't really have the the standalone version, and you would try. You could only use it as a as a, as a server. So uh, probably this might be achieved uh, via the collaboration. Uh, the, the RNA composer was uh, was developed in Poland in, in the university at the University of Warsaw, and. Uh, in, in theory, we could actually ask the ask the, 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 this our collaborators to share the source code for the integration in our pipeline. Then we would do the uh, kind of a <clears throat> analysis, um, either mutation to the DNA with mutated DNA pipe and the structural refinement in order to find the binding pocket and to use the, um, the docking to the autodoc winner. Here, we actually don't need to, to, to use this, uh, this step, step as uh, we already have the, um, the optimal sequence. So the most important thing is to get the information on the, uh, the, the 3D structure of the DNA. And there are already some some in silica pipelines in the internet, which are used for the rapid screening of the DNA aptamers against various mycotoxins, as the case study of the fumizine, aflatoxin, and ocratoxin. Okay, so indeed we try to implement different algorithms for the uh, for our optimal generation with several folding programs as you can see here we used m fold rna fold and the sig fold and uh, unfortunately uh, you you can see here that the, uh, the 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 program gave us different uh, DNA structures, and you have some some closed form uh, in in terms of the the pairing here. Uh, the, the form is closed, and then you have some some open form here, and the semi so uh, so called the semi semi open form, when probably the unpaired bases have the highest propensity for the interaction with the nivalenol molecule. So here you got the, uh, the, the open form with the uh, higher content of the unpaired bases and 
the chances, of course, are higher when you have nivolumin or mubalico to scavenge all this mycotoxin in the in the uh, polluted environment. So we got M4, mRNA4, and SIG4, but unfortunately, as as you can see, fortunately the results are not very promising. So we are still searching for the results. We have the different like different algorithms right now, which are working very well, like open fold algorithm. Open fold is is, uh, is very good for for the uh, peptide. Uh, peptide folding, but uh, it's a kind of a, a derivative from the alpha fold algorithm developed by DeepMind. And the program is designed as a deep learning system. So, uh, uh, how uh, this uh, system can be adapted to the, uh, to the DNA molecule, we still trying to investigate and probably there are some uh, there are some possibilities that we could uh, also implement implement the the DNA to uh, come up with the more prom more promising structures for our up to up to fault pipeline and M4 uh, has the best prediction in comparison uh, in, compared to the other uh, to the other algorithms published in, in, in literature. So the structure, as as you can see here, the structure was generated by RNA composer. Uh, then the model was refined with the OpenMM uh, program as a one-step simulation, and we got some kind of uh, semi semi open structure we were also trying to understand the um, the pairing and how this pairing actually correlates with the folding by calculating the so called uh, so called uh, the energy the energetics the energetics and the enter entropy entropy Compensation, energetic, energetic, energetic term for this particular structure. So we were thinking that if you would have a high chance of uh, uh, high chance of, of the binding, that probably the structure should be more more relaxed and uh, uh, less relaxed and more open. So at this point, uh, uh, the energy would increase. And also the the entropy the entropy also would increase. So uh, for this reason, uh, the open structure might be more preferential for the uh, ligand interaction. But so far, we didn't really have a find a nice correlation with the uh, open structures and the binding uh, profiles, binding protein ligand interaction profile. So here is the, we, we took the structure, uh, this structure from the literature and try to scan it uh, to find some, uh, some protein linear interaction pockets. And you can see there are some small pockets and the bigger pockets and probably the biggest pocket is, uh, is found here. Then you could probably see that the molecule is also has a tendency to uh, to go to this particular pocket, and the pockets are generated as a groups of uh, virtual atoms contributed to this particular group. Coordinates for docking are also defined as centroids of these groups, and in total, eleven groups are defined for this particular uh, ligand optimal structure. Again, this is really hard to to structure uh, to analyze all this these pockets. Uh, probably we would we would, would would like to go for this particular 
pockets and more uh, more optimization is needed to understand the logic of the of the 3D structure from of the 3D structure formation for this particular uh, for this particular molecule. And then we try to uh, to do the molecular uh, docking using the standard protocols like Autodoc Vina and Motodoc Vina and how it actually correlates with. Uh, with, our, with the affinity. So, uh, in the previous lectures, I was I was uh, talking about the, the machine learning algorithms that we have right now, <coughs> like the diff doc algorithm, which is based on the uh, reverse uh, diffusion model, <coughs> and you know, this algorithm can be used to to match exactly the binding site, um, as, as it's shown here, uh, as it's shown here in this picture, then if we would have something like the crystal structure, then we would probably be successful uh, to, uh, to, uh, to implement this uh, cutting edge technology to our research. On the other hand, uh, this might take some, uh, some, some efforts in terms of the, the training of the machine learning models because we had already <laughs> experienced some problems to, uh, to come up to the, good, to the good match where we have the very uh, low RMSD uh, RMST value at least less than and two angstrom. And if you can, if you will go to the database, you could probably find that uh, there is there are some some DNA molecules that could probably uh, bind to the <clears throat> to the ligands. So what what <clears throat> would I have to do? I would just take this model uh, uh, to tr and uh, try to reconstitute uh, the same uh, the same binding the same binding um, binding binding profile uh, in terms of the, uh, the the matching in terms of the RNA in terms of root mean square deviation value which should be the less less than two angstrom from the reference. And after that, when I'm successful, I would go further into development of this, this very sophisticated uh, and very unstable uh, 3D uh, DNA structure. So uh, at this stage, we were not successful, but uh, Presently, we have some uh, very, uh, very powerful algorithms. So I would definitely try to uh, try to implement uh, this information in the diff doc and produce maybe the, the model which closely relates to the experimental data. So what do we have here? We have uh, the out, the ligand from the literature and we screen this ligand using uh, using 11 pockets as was shown on this on this picture and as you can see there are some pockets like pocket 5 which produces the high affinity and uh, the lowest gives free energy of binding so as it's shown here so the the, 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 the highest, the, the biggest uh, and the highest affinity was found at this particular site, the biggest site where probably the, the, the ligand is trying to, uh, to lure, so trying to establish its uh, protein-ligand interaction.
uh, we had used the standard protocol, 25 uh, size, uh, the box parameter size was set to 25 in angstrom, and the, uh, here you can see the visualization of the best docking position for each pocket. Uh, some of them are closely overlapping, so you also have here the high degree of high overlapping degree between different protein uh, DNA ligand binding site. And as I already mentioned, the site uh, number five is the best in terms of the in terms of the binding. And uh, then we uh, try to reproduce reproduce the, the data uh, running to independent experiments in silica experiments and as you can see here we were successfully uh, we, we were successful in uh, in this uh, energy analysis and we got the, the same this almost the same results where we have the the highest affinity for the for this particular binding site Uh, the other the other method was uh, implemented to use the control. The, the same method was used to, to use the control to as an okra toxin and the nivaleno using uh, the same settings. And you can see here that uh, nivaleno also was found to produce the same mm, the same. Uh, affinity at this particular site. So the analysis was performed with the, with the molecule of Nivalino as a negative control uh, to, compare, to compare the results and some similarities could be observed. For example, five, pocket five has a higher affinity to, to the Nivalino substance too. However, all affinities to the Nivalino are notably higher in terms of the energy. Uh, not really notably higher in terms of the energy and this that means the, the the affinity of the of this particular ligand is lower than the uh, positive control that we have here so we have the nivaleno and the oprotoxin here and uh, the affinity is about uh, about two to two point five kilocalories kilojoules. Here's the kilojoules. Usually we are converting this in kilocalories. Uh, kilojoules per mole is higher than uh, the the reference ligand. And uh, to date, uh, the modeling procedure is established from the primary optimal sequence is uh, was actually was is to predict and to 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 design the optimal target models uh, it was predicted by uh, autodoc vina but uh, some steps in modeling uh, can be improved for example by the evaluation of other pocket searching programs uh, as I already mentioned, we don't really understand and we don't really have a good tools to, uh, to build the, uh, the precise and, and uh, validated the DNA structure. We, we still don't really understand the me mechanism by which we have this uh, folded by the, by which the you, you can produce the, the same confirmation by using different algorithms. And what is the algorithm that we can actually use for these purposes? Next, uh, the, this would be the probate, uh, this would be the MD simulation that we could try to integrate some salvation model for optimal target complex with the highest affinity. Then the algorithm can be applied to screen uh, candidate up to mass from the uh, NGS data. 
Okay, this is the, the technique we, uh, we have uh, in terms of the uh, synthetic biology, the aptam aptamia modification and some protein mod proteins modification. I would also give you the short introduction on the next project where we delved into the uh, SNP analysis of some proteins which are responsible for the uh, genomic chaos and the uh, genomic stabilities in the cell. So we will take a break and take in place in a, in a gastric cancer. And we got some kind of uh, uh, some some process which is further uh, found in a in the cancer cells to be uh, chemo resistant. So uh, by mutating uh, this particular protein, by uh, in inhibiting this particular protein, we also, uh, we would also try to, um, to generate some substances to treat, uh, to treat, uh, to make them more uh, sensible to some uh, ligands like uh, radio sensibilizers, like like the ones we have, like arena ticon, for instance. Some some substances are already uh, have, have already found to be promising uh, candidates. We had found also some substances like spiridine, seralidine substances and some antibiotics that could also uh, have potential to, uh, to be used to since, uh, in increase the sensitivity uh, of some particular uh, uh, cancers to the, uh, uh, the nuclear therapy. And Mm. On the other hand, you also have a, a, some kind of a complex uh, uh, complex pathway here where this protein mediates the RNA metabolism from the beginning to the end. And as you can see here, we have uh, uh, the, the DNA transcription and uh, some uh, processes are also related in the DNA repair and, uh, and the telomerase maintenance. And in the nucleus, you would have a formation of free mRNA before splicing and the after splicing the mature mRNA. Uh, this uh, uh, mRNA would uh, subsequently be exported to the, to the cytoplasm where the degradation and uh, uh, the expression of uh, the translation of this molecule is taking place uh, to produce some proteins. And of course, uh, this would, uh, these processes are uh, partially mediated by this protein. And when you have the abnormal uh, A2B1 expression, then uh, the, you could also uh, increase the risk to develop some cancers, also the neurodegenerative diseases and the aut autoimmune diseases. Therefore, one could try to uh, use this uh, target protein to uh, interfere with the pathogenesis of this particular um, particular pathologies, the gene for this uh, for this protein contains twelve exons, including a B1 protein specific and thirty six nucleotide mini exons. The entire left of, of exon in tron organization is the is also identical to the a1 gene which indicates the common origin 
by a gene uh, duplication. Uh, the multiple mutations were also found in, uh, in this particular gene, such as D290V to 302V, uh, which are implicated in dementia and myopathy. And some of them are also found in, in in, uh, in the patients with Peugeot disease of bone and uh, ACE, ALC, uh, ALC uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So uh, the mutations, uh, the mutation in this disease are also causing multi-system proteinopathy. And um, also, uh, this, this particular uh, protein was also found uh, to activate cyclooxygenase, co uh, cyclooxycox2, uh, COX2, and promote tumor growth and, uh, and progression. Therefore, uh, the, the interaction of these proteins with some other some other, pro some other proteins could also be taken into consideration, such as uh, COX-2, because COX-2 is also the, the target protein for anti-inflammatory substances to reduce the inflammation, uh, the, to reduce the inflammation. And the idea was to, to analyze, the, the idea of this project was to analyze, to find some SNPs, non-synonymous SNPs, and to analyze these SNPs and how they actually contribute to the protein stability, the, the, the ligand uh, binding affinity. The, for, for, for that, we are we using the, the reference ligand CPT and the RNA uh, binding affinity and would, this would of course uh, this would of course this uh, would of course contribute to the increased genomic chaos and uh, all this the other parameters probably would be uh, diminished here you have the chromosome chromosome 7 where the locus or this particular gene is located, P15.2. This is the locus for, for, this, for this gene. And uh, first, we, we wanted to uh, analyze, we, we, we wanted to screen all the possible uh, SNPs variants by using the NCBI SNP database. And, uh, and Uniprod database where, where, where we, we, we have found some information on non-synonymous SNPs. And uh, we, we had found some, uh, uh, some SNPs which are so associated with A2B1, uh, a gene in particular about uh, 8,000 uh, different SNPs were found. Uh, among them, 1,300 were found in a three prime untranslated region, and uh, about 9,000 were found in a five prime untranslated region. And uh, then we tried to, uh, to, uh, to check the uh, non-synonymous and synonymous SNPs, and we found that this gene contains 160 uh, non-synonymous and 200 synonymous SNPs. Then we tried to analyze uh, the, those SNPs which were associated with the Synonym, which was uh, with synonymous uh, mutations, with missense mutations, with the high 
probability value of more than 70%. And as you can see, we've, we have found some, some candidates at the position of 66 and 92. These two candidates uh, were uh, selected on the basis of the high, highest probability value. So after that, we were trying to, uh, uh, to Im implement this information to the protein. We, uh, we designed the proteins uh, uh, having these mutations. And uh, after that, we analyzed the stability of these mutants uh, using the Monte Carlo protocol. So here you, you see that uh, this analysis gave us the information on the stability and uh, it was done by measuring the, the energy function here where the energy of the mutants would be elevated, which means that the stability would of this protein would decrease. And here's the specific threshold, which separates the, uh, which se separates the stable structure from the unstable structure. So uh, most of the, the, the mutants are not really uh, passing these thresholds and therefore uh, the stability would also be decreased. We had also checked the, um, the information on, in, the, in the cosmic database where uh, we could find some uh, mutations associated with the particular, particular site, with the particular position uh, within the, within the, I mean, uh, acid structure with the amino acid sequence and we had found that 92 position we had found the, the prevalent mutation among the other mutation this mutation would give us the highest uh, uh, incidence in, uh, in, the, in the patients this is the experimental data and this experimental data nicely correlates with our mm, theoretical data. So here you see that if you would uh, probably uh, reconstitute this mutation in a protein, you have a very, mm, very uh, high energy in comparison to the first mutant in the wild type protein and this mutation would contribute the most to the structural imbalance in this protein. We also did the most of protein stability prediction. And you, you, you can see here that both, uh, both uh, mutants uh, provided the, uh, the information where you have the, the positive energy or the positive energy of of molecule, which means that the stability would, would decrease. Here is also the mutation and analysis, kind of a, uh, energy decomposition analysis where you are using Monte Carlo protocol for this particular uh, mutants. And as you can see, some, uh, uh, some energy terms uh, such as uh, such as uh, electrostatic potential and uh, uh, Leonard Jones, uh, Leonard Jones repulsive, uh, repulsive energies, and uh, Leonard Jones attractive, uh, attractive energies between atoms would contribute uh, to the uh, to the uh, instability to the elevation, elevated energy in, for, in, in the mutant proteins. Here you also have a uh, fasol, which is uh, 
which was specified as a Lizaridis uh, car plus salvation energy. It's usually specified as a salvation energy, which was also elevated in both, uh, in a, in a, especially in a 66 mutant here. And uh, in a 92 mutant, mostly governed by the electrostatic energy and uh, in comparison to in comparison to the 96 mutant. So we also did uh, the sequence analysis for uh, the uh, vial type and the mutants uh, to find uh, some, uh, some, some structures. This is the conservation analysis to find the structures which are more, uh, uh, more conserved and less conserved in the protein in the protein uh, structure. And uh, as you can see, you have the binding site where the RNA molecule is interacting with the binding pocket. And this binding pocket is mutated uh, at the position of the 66 to 92, uh, producing also the, the decrease in the uh, protein RNA interaction and uh, uh, some of them some of the residues are highly conserved but if you will try and to analyze the, 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 the binding pocket you can see that uh, this, these are uh, some some re residues which will form this binding pockets are actually uh, evolutionary not the not uh, very conserved uh, in comparison to some uh, some structural parts of the molecule where you could find the highly conserved residues. Uh, and uh, you also have a, the second binding site called the kind of a st steric binding site here, which is not shown on this picture. And this steric binding site is located in, in this area where you could find the highly conserved uh, amino acid residues. You could also uh, analyze the, <coughs> the, uh, the post-translational modification uh, and how this post-translational modification would would uh, contribute to the stability of the protein. And here you have the, the, the methylation, which was, uh, which is affecting the mutation, the site at 90, at 92 position, at position of 92. And uh, uh, here we try to compare this mutant uh, to understand how uh, what are the energies and how these energies are changing upon the methylation uh, on this, of this specific amino acid. And we had found that uh, when you methylate this uh, protein, you would, uh, you would decrease the, the, uh, the energy the energy of the protein, the total energy of the protein would be decreased further, such as if you have the, uh, the lower energy for the mutant, then after the methylation, you would decrease it, decrease it to uh, at least a 10 uh, rosette energy unit, which means that the Methylation would also con contribute further to destabilize the whole structure of the protein. So uh, this is exactly what we had found in our further analysis using the standard Monte Carlo protocol. You can see that the, the structures are uh, giving you uh, kind of uh, uh, giving you the the plot where you, you you see the elevation of the 
this is the elevation of the energy upon the methylation. You also have the, the differences in the uh, surface accessible, uh, solvent accessible surface area upon the methylation. And this is exactly what we have here. If you would methylate, you would certainly increase this uh, solvent accessible surface area. And you could also analyze the different domains within the within the within the protein structure, and uh, where you know in, the, in this plot you see that when you have the methylation, you would also produce some kind of a, a deviated a deviated uh, structure from the from the initial model. Similar patterns were also found uh, in the analysis of radius of gyration. When you perform the methylation, you would also increase the, the gyration radius uh, of the methylated protein. Okay, and this, these are the some information how we had found this uh, post-translation of modification profiles. We had used the uh, we had used uh, the uh, the algorithm. We, we had used the Pi MT plugin algorithm, and uh, we also had uh, used uh, uh, some tools like Gene Mania tools to describe the uh, Gene Gene interaction network. Had found in. Uh, in, on, on, on this picture, we also uh, used uh, uh, the hydrophobicity scale uh, uh, to, to produce this kind of picture and the Casti uh, Casti PSOVA to find the uh, interaction of our. Uh, ligand with the with the receptor uh, uh, this is quite interesting also this uh, this results are based on the experimental ic50 where we had the validation of our uh, our ligand with the with the uh, with the protein and we had found that uh, you have different binding site for this particular ligand, uh, which based on the matching to the experimental data found in the literature. And if you will perform it to the uh, RNA protein binding site, it would simply not work because the, the receptor is too huge for this, uh, for this small ligand. So here, as you can, you can see that some of the uh, results that we produced using the Foldex protein for the RNA docking. In both cases, you have to do decrease in the affinity and the increase of the, the energy. And the same holds true for, uh, for the uh, molecular docking results. And uh, we could also pro produce the similar results using the uh, MPBS, MMPBSA, GPSA uh, patterns, my models uh, specifically for the, for BIPO, for MMPBSA, uh, so the impl implicit salvation model using fast DRH algorithm. Okay, this is, uh, this is all about the, uh, this particular project. This was successful and it was published in the High Impact Factor Journal. So those of you who wants to know more, you can download the paper, which is, uh, which is open source uh, uh, on, the <coughs> on the ACS, ACS website. So, you can simply download this <coughs> uh, for your further reading. So, uh, 
uh, we can we can start tomorrow by from from the from the different project we are also where we are also analyzing the uh, non-synonymous SNPs in in different target receptor and I will talk about some some other approaches to, uh, using machine learning on algorithms uh, and how we can actually integrate it into the chemoinformatics in uh, synthetic biology. If you don't really, really have any, if you don't really have any questions, I will meet you tomorrow to discuss the next projects. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.